Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Falcon Focus. My name is Vaughn Purdy, your host for this segment. And one of the things I'm very excited about this season is you all, our audience, get to meet some of the people behind the scenes at Simmons College of Kentucky. So with me today is a person who's been on our show before, uh, who's come back today to talk to us about some things she's been doing over the last, since the last time she's been here. Uh, I'm happy to invite Dr. Nancy C., who's chairperson of the sociology department at Simmons College of Kentucky. Welcome, Dr. C. Thank you for inviting me. Thank Glad you for be being here. here. Thank you for being here. So tell our audience, for those who haven't seen you on the segment before, what your uh, area is at Simmons College and how long you've been at the college. Okay, well, I am the chair of the Department of Sociology at Simmons College of Kentucky. I've been at Simmons oh, about five years yeah, now. Yeah, it goes by fast, doesn't uh -huh, it? Uh-huh, it does. <laughs> It so, really does. so tell us some of the new and exciting things you're doing. Did you come in as department chair oh, or did no. you elevate up to that level? No, no. Actually, I came into um, a, a, in an emergency situation. Okay. Yeah, they needed a professor. One of the professors had uh, taken ill okay. and was no longer able to be there. And so I came to, to fill in okay. the spot and my spot became permanent. Oh, wonderful. That means you're doing great, great work. Mm -hmm. So tell our audience about you, a little bit of your background. Where were you? Where are you from? Where did you receive your education? Right. Well, um, I received my undergraduate, my uh, master's, and my doctorate from the University of Toledo in Toledo, Ohio. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And, uh, but before that, uh, because I'm a non-traditional student, okay. I started my undergraduate at age 47. Whoa, you don't even look past 47 now. <laughs> so, but anyway, I started at age 47, uh -huh. went straight through, got my doctorate. Okay. And uh, while I was pursuing my doctorate, writing my dissertation, mm -hmm. uh, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky with my husband. Okay. And um, it was here that I really found out there's an HBCU in Louisville. Ah, that's what we hear a lot. We hear uh -huh. that a lot. I was the same way when I moved here eight years ago. Mm -hmm. There's an HBCU. So you learned about the HBCU from the person mm -hmm. that reached out to you? No, I had learned about it. I think I saw it in the newspaper okay. or something like that. Good. And I thought, this is where I want to teach. Oh, wonderful. But it was uh, a roundabout way. I taught at several institutions okay. around uh, the area after receiving my Ph.D. And then uh, the opportunity came to teach at Simmons, and oh. I came at just the right time. Oh, tell us about Simmons. your experience, because I, I, I always interact with professors, but not as much as I like to, mm -hmm. where we seem to be in different worlds. But you all are on the forefront of Absolutely. educating the students. You see them every day. Mm -hmm. You recognize their talents. Absolutely. You recognize their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and anybody who attends an HBCU, what we always talk about is how we have a smaller nurturing environment. Mm -hmm. So you're one of the nurturers, as I like to call it. So what was your first year like at Sim? Well, my first year, it took a lot of getting used to uh -huh. um, because the other places that I taught were much better resourced than right. Simmons. Yeah, we talk about that all the time, our resources mm -hmm. or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. But tell me how long it took. I mean, there have been a lot of changes. At oh, Simmons. So Simmons tell our audience, has changed yes. so much. Well, like I said, when I first came there, um, I said, wow, uh, coming from, from these much better resourced mm -hmm. areas, Simmons made me have to teach. Right. I didn't have anything to lean on. I didn't have the technology right. or any of those things. And I went back to, you know, just really basic teaching mm -hmm. with Simmons. Uh, but since then, uh, we have been able to add so much to our school. When I came in, I, I was an adjunct professor, mm -hmm. and then I was hired uh, to work on a program to um, build up our, our learning center. Okay. And after that, then they had the full-time position of, oh, wow. um, uh, of becoming the department chair okay. and uh, doing sociology there at, at Simmons. And with that, I've watched how our students have grown, but I've also watched how our uh, school has grown. Okay. And how we've really become competitive. Oh, I love to hear that word, competitive. Mm -hmm. What does that look like to you? And, and, and do you see that spirit resonate in our students yet? I mean, because we're always trying to come up with ways to make Simmons better. Mm -hmm. It can be a challenge, as you say, because of resources. Uh, but from your perspective, do the students see what it is we're trying to achieve? I think so. Okay. 
Now, um, Simmons is like every other HBCU. Mm -hmm. We've done more with less. Yes, it's something our president always says. Mm -hmm. yep. And, and uh, our students have caught on. I had one student and uh, you know, I asked the student, I said, have you had any leadership? And, and, and uh, we were trying to get her, her resume together. Uh -huh. And she says, no, I've never done that on any of the jobs I've had. And I looked and I said, they have not, uh, in the job market have not noticed how brilliant this particular student mm -hmm. was, or is. Mm -hmm. And uh, since being at Simmons, the student has entered into professional careers. Oh, wow. Even uh, before graduating, okay, and um, to to see this person blossom mm -hmm. and interact with so many different people, and uh, even becoming such a blessing to Simmons. But not only uh, have I seen that with one student, mm -hmm. I have seen it with multiple oh, students. What do you think is the secret to what we do? I, I think coming. Of course, I graduated from an HBCU. Mm -hmm. I think the secret, if you will, or the reason that students can do well or see their potential is because someone takes the time to nurture, Absolutely. pour into them and mentor. Now you do a really, really good job of that. So tell us more about your students because a part of what you do is also to get students in internships. Mm -hmm. Can you tell our audience a little bit more about the student successes you've had and what types of internships you've gotten for the students? Yeah, the internships have really been a highlight mm -hmm. uh, for, for us with the students. Um, when I first came, the internships it was really kind of hard, you know, right. scrapping together some mm -hmm. internships. And the students did a wonderful job going out finding their own internships because it's a requirement right. um, for their uh, degree. How many hours do they have to take? Right now, they have to do um, the equivalent of um, a full semester. Okay. And so, generally, they'll do in a 16-week um, semester they'll do 10 hours a week okay. in the internship. And then some choose to do it during the summer. Okay. And um, for several of the students now, we've seen the internships turn into employment. Oh, great. Do we have some examples? I, um, you talked about one student that mm -hmm. you saw blossom. Where right. is that student now? She's working for the health department. She's oh, also working for Simmons College of Kentucky. Okay. And uh, she has worked uh, in a program at U of L, oh, doing wonderful. some of uh, their research. She's, okay. Uh, spread. She's really been a star. Oh, good. And um, I, I look at other students that we have. We have one that uh, was working with Metropolitan with the Housing Authority, uh -huh. and uh, that's transitioned to okay. a job great, at, great, great, at the great. Urban League, and and uh, so many others. Okay. Uh, not only that, but our students have been competitive in. Um, the idea that they're going on for graduate degrees. Mm -hmm. Had uh, one student just got her graduate degree oh. from um, Bellarmine here. Wonderful. Another from Wake Forest. Wonderful. We've got a few that are in um, IUS Good. here. And so we, we're we seeing our students do some We are seeing, things. they, they yeah. are doing. And but, they're holding their own. Right, but that's what most college students, college students should do. I think in our community, uh, Corporations in the community have overlooked mm -hmm. some of the contributions or the contributor, uh, the potential of our students. I know in some of my work in community engagement, mm -hmm. it's not as hard anymore to, to call up mm -hmm. contacts and say, these are some of our students. I find more and more employers are reaching out for that. And mm -hmm. I'm so happy that they're doing that. So if you're an employer looking for our students, please reach out to Simmons uh, because our students are seeking these opportunities and they're ready for these opportunities. So which is a wonderful thing that we do with our students. So tell me a little bit more, let's dig in a little bit about it with your sociology curriculum, if you mm -hmm. will. What are some of the things that you are doing to prepare them uh, for the field of sociology and what do you think is the key to their success and the success of what you're doing? Well, I intentionally uh, add into the courses that I teach, and I teach quite a few. Uh -huh. Um, things that will prepare them for the workforce. Like today I had a class in my uh, social psychology class ah. and I'm teaching the students how to code, how to do qualitative coding. Oh. They're actually coding um, the speech that um, 
Trump made wonderful before um, January 6th. So how long does that take? Is it, how long was the speech? The speech is an uh, hour and 10 minutes. Okay. It's about 30 pages of coding. Wow. And the students are dividing up between themselves and they're trying to answer the question, did Trump's speech actually cause the people to uh, react right. in the aggressive way that they did? And they're working on, um, they're going by theory. Okay. Uh, Matsumoto said yeah. three uh, emotions will predict aggression. And so they're coding to see if those three emotions are in the speech. Okay, what are the three emotions? The three emotions are anger, uh -huh. uh, anger, contempt, and disgust. Wow, in that order, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter which order, oh, but, those but when you have those all three, three together, of those, yeah, they that's, predict. That's like combustion. Um, right, right. They predict aggression. Exactly, and so, do, so do you also do those types of codings with different kind of speeches, like monumental speeches, and then you mm -hmm. take three different factors? Is that how coding well, uh, works? Well, we, we talk about it. Okay. Um, for instance, uh, with Martin Luther King's speech, okay. anger came out, but anger does not predict okay. violence. Okay. Uh, anger is a motivator. Okay. And sometimes it can motivate one way and sometimes another. And so that's why uh, with King's speeches, the people did not react with violence even though uh, it, it caused them to be angry mm -hmm. because when they saw the conditions. And so uh, for many people, it motivated them to go out and do something to change wow, those conditions. Wow. So with projects like this, what do you teach the students that they can do with this sort of thing? It, are, are there jobs for this sort of absolutely, thing? What, absolutely, what does that look because like? Because those are research jobs okay. that they can do. Um, but not only that, in my sociology of education class, I have the students incorporate what they learned in the sociology of education class into a personal education plan wow. for a student. Okay. And so um, they get a K through 12 student and then they look at the risk and the protective factors, the academic risk and protective. And this really trains them for like social work mm -hmm. or uh, the parole board where they have to do a lot of writing, um, doing uh, writing about uh, the people that they're representing. And so that trains them for that type of job when uh, in my sociology of aging class, aging the life, uh -huh. they do a life history interview uh -huh. with an older person. Okay. And so they're really uh, learning how to get information okay. and how to write up that information now, and research skills. Oh good. So is that a part of how many courses do you teach in total and how many students, what's the average size of your class? Our classes tend to be very small, okay. uh, especially the upper level classes. We have, um, I have a 4-4 teaching load, which is pretty heavy yeah. um, by university standards. Um, and so I probably teach about seven different classes. Okay, and you're on a, you teach every day, but there are no classes on Friday here at Simmons, right? No, okay. no. And, um, well, one of the perks, at least, of being a, a department chair is I can plan when I teach my class. Good, that's and great. And so I, I set aside two teaching days and then two uh, days that I work okay. um, outside of teaching. And that works pretty well for me. Okay. Now tell us how many department, how many people in the sociology department, how many professors? You're right the now, chair. I'm the chair and I have uh, about five other professors okay. and uh, some of them come from uh, the world of, world of work uh -huh. right here in Louisville. Uh -huh. um, one of my professors uh, is a counselor in JCPS. Okay. I have another that runs a nonprofit. I have another um, that uh, he just finished his PhD and he's doing some great work mm -hmm. up in Dayton. Okay. And um, I, I have others that have been in it a long time. I have one uh, retired professor mm -hmm. and she uh, is just a world of knowledge. Now, is she new to Simmons? No. How are you attracting them? Well, um, this particular professor, uh, Dr. Broadus Gay, She's not new at all. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, um, I'm teaching a lot of classes that she has taught in the past and she came back oh, wonderful. and is bringing her, her knowledge to teach social theory. Um, we do try to recruit them, 
but I'm really, really careful with my uh, professors because I want to make sure that they have a good match with our students exactly. at Simmons mm -hmm. and um, understand our students and are, are willing to do uh, the hard work. And a little extra work sometimes uh -huh. that they may yeah. need. Do you have a good mix of uh, traditional versus non-traditional students or does sociology lean toward uh, one or the other? Well, it's changing. When I first started, I had quite a few non-traditional students. And I have to say, I am really proud of our non-traditional students. I had one that came back last week. She graduated. And uh, her senior project, she had to uh, write a business plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, she actually got the business growing okay. out of her senior project. Okay. And she says, I want to get back. I want to start a scholarship for sociology students. Has she done that yet? She has. Oh, wonderful. And so we're going to talk about okay. that, how we can do that. You oh, know, great. Contributing every month. Well, we want to help with that to make that mm -hmm. happen, make that happen. Uh, that is just such a wonderful, you know, the stories and the fact that you pour into these students. What do you see as, we're talking about how we want to grow Simmons and mm -hmm. the uh, course offerings, mm -hmm. and we're having those discussions mm -hmm. about that. What are some of the new courses or course offerings you'd like to add to our curriculum and if you had to put it on a time track what would it be well one um, one course our curriculum our, our major that has really been in demand for our students has been psychology and some of my sociology students they said well I asked them, why are you taking sociology well because you don't offer psychology uh -huh. And so that's something that I would like to see. Okay. And then uh, sociology right now is the only STEM okay. uh, major at Simmons. I'd like to see us expand into more well, STEM focused. Those are the plans. We hope mm -hmm. that's going to uh, come to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, what we're going to do right now is take a break. And okay. when we come back, I want to share with our audience a very special project that you're working on. Sure. Okay. We'll be right back. The music department at Simmons College now offers a gospel track for its music performance degree. Our department of music exists to develop musical knowledge and skill. Students become beneficiaries of program features and faculty that distinguish music as both an academic and artistic discipline. Program options include brass and woodwind instruments, as well as guitar, bass, strings, piano, percussion, and voice. Your gifts will be encouraged and developed by a staff of experienced performing musicians and by the warm support of your peers. You will have frequent opportunities to perform, including vocal ensemble, gospel choir, jazz ensemble, marching band, and other ensembles, both on and off campus. Your music program can go no higher than those who lead it. Now is your time to build a strong music ministry from within. Help support passion already in your community. Help develop gifts already in your congregation. You might have the next James Cleveland in your church and don't know it. The heritage of artistic dignity found at historic black colleges and universities the tradition of black excellence in gospel music, the calling to use your gift to turn hearts. Your journey toward obtaining a bachelor's degree in music starts now. Simmons College of Kentucky. Apply today. Become a part of the legacy. Focus. I'm happy to have my guest, Dr. Nancy C. of our sociology department. As we were talking earlier uh, on the break, Dr. C., um, you've got some really, really innovative programs and internships and opportunities for our students. 
but you also are doing some things in our community. So tell us about this really, really great project you've been working on for probably the last year and a half mm -hmm. that impacts Simmons and the community around us. Right, we've been working on an asset mapping mm -hmm. uh, uh, program and asset mapping research is part of the Kerner um, 2.0, yes, Kerner we, Commission 2.0. And we did a show on Kerner Commission. We didn't really talk about all the different facets of the Kerner mm -hmm. Commission, but the Kerner Commission in brief just looks at those aspects of society that impacts blacks mm -hmm. and why blacks have or have not advanced mm -hmm. since the issues that took a, took place in about the 60s, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so what is your, what is asset mapping doing and how are you digging into that? Well, in our asset mapping program, myself mm -hmm. and then um, the co-principal investigator, Ja'Cory Arthur, yes. Councilman Arthur. Who's our councilman, mm -hmm. our local Metro Council mm -hmm. And uh, he also teaches at Simmons. And he teaches music at Simmons College uh -huh. of Kentucky. Well, and he also teaches, uh, we co-teach a class, oh, Community Problems and Solutions. Oh, that's and wonderful. And that's our vehicle for doing the asset mapping okay. because we're teaching our students how to do neighborhood level research. Wonderful. And then they just go out and do it. What? And so asset mapping is a little bit different. Um, usually, when people look at neighborhoods, they go in and they want to see everything that's wrong with the neighborhood. Right. We're going in looking for everything that's right with that, the neighborhood. That is wonderful because you're reversing the paradigm mm -hmm. and saying, let's see right. where we are now and see what's good about it and then we work to make the changes as needed. Yeah, and we're taking it to the next level because we're not determining ourselves. We're not going in like uh, somebody says, the, the great maroon savior, you know, from Simmons. <laughs> we're not going in there uh, with our preconceived notion mm -hmm. of what this neighborhood's assets are, we're asking the people, okay. what do you see as an asset in your neighborhood? What do you need in your neighborhood? What do you have that you like in your neighborhood? Okay, and, and what, are, so, what are some of the responses you're getting? Well, what the uh, people tend to like in the neighborhood is uh, the convenience stores and the things that are there. Okay. Uh, but they really, really want, and we just did one neighborhood, we've done Parkland so far. Okay. And uh, they want things for their young people. Okay, such as, have they mentioned what they actually want? They want activities. Okay. And, and think about this, Parkland doesn't have a park. <laughs> you, we talked about that. Right. And I know nothing about the history of Parkland, but to name something Parkland, you exactly. would think that there would be parks around. Right. So. What other things that he mentioned that, that they want and where is this research going afterwards? Mm -hmm. Well, the research, number one, is for the people there. Okay. And we're trying to figure out how we can get this into the hands of the Parkland community. Okay. But the other thing is that we want this to go to people who want to partner with the community to make the community be what they want that community to okay. be. You know, mm -hmm. not what we think needs to be in that community. But what does the community want? Okay. You know, how can they take ownership of things that are happening in their community? And so this is what we're doing. We're just starting out. Parkland was our pilot. Okay. Okay. We'll do another um, in the class. We offer the class in the spring. Okay. And another good thing about it is that we're able to uh, get people from the community to participate. And so they get to take classes right there at oh, Simmons. Oh, I did not know. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. that yeah. If aspect. they're communicating, they, they get to take uh, classes at Simmons. Okay. Uh, or at least this particular class at Simmons, where they're learning how to do the research, mm -hmm. and then we were able to obtain funding, and so we're able to uh, pay our students okay. and uh, selected students and community members that are willing to go out and do that hard work of canvassing the communities and uh, finding those those hidden gems mm -hmm. and some not so hidden right. in every community and then making them manifest so um, others can see. So what have been the most surprising things you've uh, uncovered? I know you're working on only one project in the Parkland neighborhood, mm -hmm. but what are some of the other uh, items that they mention as gems or their other needs? Mm -hmm. What are the things they like most? I would think in most communities they're Schools, churches, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Right. Is that what's coming? Is that what's coming out of the research? Actually, um, there are quite a few churches in Parkland 
but the Parkland um, residents that we were able to canvas um, did not mention the churches. And so, you know, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Are people attending the churches that don't live in the neighborhood? You know, and, um, and what ways can the uh, churches, uh, their assets be harnessed? And I'm not talking about just the financial assets. No, but the, just the assets. Assets don't uh -huh. necessarily mean money. I'm sure right, just, uh, right, right. But their presence in the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, to, to join with the uh, community there. And so, uh, and perhaps the, many of the people that attend the church once lived in Parkland, but have moved to other neighborhoods, okay. you know, and so they still see it as an asset, um, but they're just not living there. And sometimes I call those phenomenological uh, yeah. residents in the neighborhood. Their heart is there, even though their presence, right. uh, they might live somewhere else. So what neighborhoods do you hope to, to uh, involve in the asset mapping next? you have any in mind? We are looking at a few, but I don't want to announce right. them yet. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, we can't announce on our show, Dr. C. No, well, not where, yet. Do, where do you want to go? Where do you see um, this asset mapping going and growing? How how do you hope to see it in the next year or two? What do you well, we want to add more um, community involvement okay. into the asset mapping. Um, so it's not Simmons Right. going in there but just Simmons we have the facilities right we're you we we're, have we're using our brand and campus mm -hmm. to involve you Absolutely. and to invite you and also to teach them mm -hmm. about that's right. looking in your own backyard and figuring out mm -hmm. your asset right and you say some of them are receptive because they're coming to take classes mm -hmm. or partnering with us right okay great and so uh, it, and we're seeing both we're okay. seeing partnerships as well as people um, who have taken the class with us. And uh, the class that uh, Councilman Arthur and I teach, we, uh, Councilman Arthur, he does the heavy lifting of teaching the students how to do the research. Oh, and he leads them out, he led them out last spring where they actually went door to door doing the canvassing. Um, and I talk about the issues, I teach the theoretical basis of what we're doing. Uh, in the neighborhood and what have you. So we have a really nice partnership and people in the community, I think they enjoy learning things like that. Oh, wonderful. That is what, uh, as, as we close, I, I just want to say, um, that is what Simmons should be about, engaging the community right. and letting people see what it means to have an HBCU in your mm -hmm. backyard and the assets and the education that is available to you right here in your backyard. Right, that's the difference um, between an HBCU and a predominantly white institution. Yeah. Listen, uh, for an HBCU, as the neighborhood goes, that's how we go. Exactly. We have skin in the game, and so we want to see our neighborhoods progress. We want to see them uh, being able to change and to move uh, forward. That is so wonderful. Uh, and again, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I appreciate you bringing our audience all the work that's being done behind the scenes in the sociology department and the wonderful work being done at Simmons College of Kentucky. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, audience, for watching us this week and, and join us next time on Falcon Focus.